This morning, I want you to go with me to the book of Joshua. Just for this Sunday, I'm taking a break from Ecclesiastes. The next two Sundays, I'll complete the book of Ecclesiastes. This morning, I want to just share one thought from the book of Joshua, chapter number six. Book of Joshua is a very interesting book. Book of Joshua, the Bible says, is a book about God fulfilling his promises in the lives of his people. It is a book where the faithfulness of God was seen in the lives of people who had come out of Egypt following this God that they have been worshipping for the past 400 years. And when they come out into the wilderness, they didn't know that they are going to be taken into a promised land. And God's plan has always been to take his people into the promised land and establish them in the promised land. But because of their unbelief, they wandered in the wilderness for almost 40 years. And at the end of that 40 years, a new generation rises up. And in this new generation, God gives a command to Joshua and gives him leadership and says, I want you now to lead into the the promised land. And the book of Joshua is a clear evidence That God is a God who is faithful and no matter which generation comes and which generation goes, that God will accomplish his people, his purposes in the midst of his people. Can you say amen? The book of Joshua is such a godly reminder. It starts with the funeral of Moses and it ends with three funerals of Joshua, Eliezer and Joseph. Why would you start a book with funerals? You start a book on conquest, you start a book on promise being fulfilled with three funerals and you end it with three funerals, you begin with one. Why? Because it it is a book that says whether man is there or not, God is faithful, he will complete what he has begun. Can you say amen? God is a God who keeps his word. You You may receive a promise for your life this year and you may not have seen it come to pass this year. But don't lose heart, don't lose hope. God is a God who keeps his promises and he will do it in the lifetime as well as in the life beyond you in in, in time to come. Because he's a God and his word will always come to pass. So in book of Joshua, God was reminding his people that he is the sovereign God. He is the one who begins a good work and he is the one who completes the good work. And in every aspect of our lives, he is Lord. Can you say amen? So book of Joshua is a very interesting book and it's a book that I keep coming back to every now and then in my own private time. Why? Because I want to glean the understanding of who God is, the awesome God that we serve, the mighty God who is the mighty deliverer. And in this book, I want you to look at chapter 6 this morning with me but before you look at chapter 6 go to one verse in Joshua chapter 21 and look at verse 45 let it give as an anchor to what I'm just saying the Bible says in Joshua chapter 21 and verse 45 not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed the last four words underline it circle it memorize it all came to pass not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed all came to pass our God is a good God our God is a God who takes his time people would have been wondering what happened 400 years they were in slavery did God forget them no God was just dealing God was just patient God was just long-suffering he was just doing his deeper work in the lives of his people Time came, he set them up, he he mightily delivered them. Then he brings them into the wilderness and he leads them for 40 years. Again, it would seem like God has deserted them in the wilderness. No, God was with them in all their journey. Time and time again, it doesn't matter how long it took, but God is a God who brings his people into the promised land and fulfills his promise. Not one failed, say this with me, not one failed. All came to pass. He's a God who specializes in fulfilling all the promises that he has made. One of the things that you and I, we need to understand about our God is, you may say that our God takes a long time to do a lot of things. 
If you look at the Old Testament, that's how it seems like God was patiently working his purposes through one generation after generation. It takes a long time. But in this modern day and age, you and I, we don't have long time. We want everything done like yesterday. You know, and we want everything to be perfect. But the reality is, God is not into making things fast. You know, even within the church circle, the, the, the catchphrase that people like to hear is, we are the fastest growing, we are the, we are the largest, we are the fastest. All those things, when it comes to kingdom, it's very different. I want you to pay attention to this. In leadership, when I was, when I was, uh, when I was teaching on re- leadership, I usually use this example. There is an example of, uh, in 1994, where in Santa Monica, in, in California, when there was an earthquake, it destroyed some parts of the bridge or the, or the freeway. And in 1994, the governor at that time wanted to, wanted to complete this because this bridge, this uh, freeway was, was, uh, was instrument in bringing a lot of businesses. It was transporting people. And if this bridge was not working, if this freeway was not working, it is going to affect them one million per day in business revenue. So they wanted to do it as quickly as they can. But you all know when it comes to government and bureaucracy, it's going to take ages before a contract is signed, a tender is set let out, someone t- takes ownership of it, and then to, to, to pass every law, to f- pass every safety regulation, and all those things, it's going to take time. So they calculated, I- even to pass the tender out, it's going to take them about six months. And then to complete the whole project and to have this freeway fully done up, it's going to take them at least two years. So the governor was prepared to make some changes. He said, no, 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 we're going to make every uh, government official work near the spot, on the spot itself. So on the spot, there will be one building, and in that building, all the government officials, whoever needs to be involved, will be all in one house, in one place, and they will sign as, as things come in. We will want to speed up this process. Then they did a tender. And the company that took it promised to deliver the project in 160 days. And in 160 days, we will build this bridge. We will build this freeway. So they, they, they gave it to this company, and they gave them an incentive for every single day that you finish earlier than schedule, earlier than agreed schedule, we will give you $200,000 per day. So there was an incentive. So this company that took it put their, sh- put their shift workers, 12-hour shifts each, each day, 12-hour shifts. They had their supervisors, managers, everyone on site continually doing work. And they completed that, that freeway in 66 days and they earned 14.9 million extra as bonus because they completed 74 days ahead of schedule now world celebrates these sort of things you you do it fast you do it efficient you do it completed that's that's leadership quality leadership is about knowing what you want to do and then go after it and get it done And get it done faster, get it done efficiently, get it done effectively so that all these things can be, we can grow, we can become this, we can become that. But when it comes to God and the way he works, he's not into just being efficient and just becoming effective. But our God, as I taught you earlier, he's a God who is efficacious. I want you to learn that word. He's a God who is an efficacious God. What is an efficacy? Efficacy is he does the right things at the right time, in the right manner, with the right motive, with the right people to produce the right result. So our God is a God who waits for all these things to come together. Is it efficient? May not be. Is it effective? May not be. But he is always efficacious he's a God who knows how to do it and how to do it well for his own glory and I want you to paint I want you to see this picture in Joshua chapter 6 in Joshua chapter 6 there's a story about this Jericho 
the city of Jericho being occupied. This is a mighty fortress city, a wall that rose from the ground all the way to the sky. No, no army can scale that mountain, that, that wall. No one can penetrate it. So it was fortified. And look at the way the security was set up. In verse 1, the Bible says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the mighty men of valor. I want you to think about this, how the security was so tight and nobody can come in, nobody can go out. Everybody was accounted for. It was an unimaginable fortress. But in that scenario, God was leading his children to come and possess the promised land. I want you to paint, I want you to see this picture with the eyes of faith. Verse 2 says, the Lord says to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the mighty men of valor. Even in the human sense, it was highly impossible to penetrate, to possess. God says to Joshua, the man of God, I have already given you. I have given you. It is a perfect tense. It's a, it's a perfect tense. In other words, it's, it, it's, it's a prophetic perfect tense. In, in prophetic timetable, God says, I already see this done. It is no lo- it's not something that I will do. It is something that I've already sanctioned and done and allowed. So you will have this. I have given you the Jericho into your hand and its king and the mighty men of valor. That means don't look at the external and, and, and lose hope and lose heart. Look at what I have promised. I have already given it to you. You got it. And then he says, now tell your people. Verse 3. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Then shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. When you hear the sound of the trumpet. Then all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. What was God saying? God says, I give you seven days, six days, walk around the city of Jericho. Now, the city of Jericho, Bible scholars say, it's about nine acres of land, fortified walls. So for them to walk around, it would have probably taken them half a day. So they did, they did that. The whole entire people will walk around following the priests, following the Ark of the Covenant, and they will follow. And this is for six days they are supposed to do once each day. But then he says, on the seventh day, I want you to pay attention to this, because on the seventh day, every Jewish people know, every Israelite know, on the seventh day, you don't work. On the seventh day, you do what? You rest. Because seventh day is a day of rest. But here, the Lord of the Sabbath the God who instituted Sabbath, he reverses the thing and he says, on the seventh day, I commission you to walk. So what do they do? They wake up early in the morning and they have to walk around the city of Jericho seven times on that seventh day. And then at the end of it, they scream and shout and they shout in uniform, in, in concert they shout and the walls come down flat. And then each of them will just walk in and possess the land. I want you to pay attention to this because for six days they walk around once. On the seventh day they walk around seven times. It is a, it's a time of rest but yet they were doing work. And what kind of work were they doing? They were doing God's work on the seventh day. That's what sa- Sabbath is supposed to be. Do God's work. In other words, think about God. Pray, for, pray and have a leisure time in the presence of God. And that's exactly what they were doing. So this was not a fight. They were not bad. They were not, they were not involved in a warfare. They were just involved in worshipping God, in, in honoring God. But I want you to pay attention to how they walked around for six days. Go with me to verse 10. In verse 10, Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard, Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until that day. I tell you to shout. 
then you shall shout. I want you to think about it. For six days, they were walking around the wall. But for six days when they were walking, how did they walk? They walked in silence. They kept their mouth shut. They are not supposed to shout. They were in silence. It was a time of silence as they were walking around the wall for six days. And then on the seventh day at the appointed time, when Joshua rises up and says, now shout. They shouted and the walls came down flat. What do I understand from this text? You know, Joshua 6 is a beautiful picture of how God works. It's a beautiful picture of who God is. This is a picture where you see the judgment falling upon Jericho. It's a picture of where Jericho was judged for their sinfulness, for their wickedness. But even in the midst of sinfulness and wickedness in Jericho, God still showed mercy for one family. What's that family's name? Rahab. One family was shown mercy. So you can see a picture of God's judgment. You can also see the picture of God's mercy coming upon Rahab. And you can also see the picture of God's grace upon his people that without fighting, without lifting up weapons, they have a victory in their battle. God was gracious. You see a beautiful picture of who God is and the way he works. And the way he works in this chapter is amazing. He says to the people, all you have to do is just do the very simplest thing you can do. The little effort that you can do. All you have to do is just walk around, nothing else. Just simple things daily. Do it. And then on that final day, do it again seven times. But at the end of it, shout. The thing that I hear from here is this. There is a time to be silent. There is a time to shout. But what determines when I'm silent and when I shout? And what is the key for this victory? The key for this victory is not in the silence nor in the shout. The victory, the key for this victory is in obedience to God. That God had spoken. God has said, I have given you this land. I have given you this city. I've given you this people. I've given you the kingdom. I've given you the king. And all you need to do is believe and follow. Believe and obey. All you have to do in life, in in any aspect of your life, where you're facing a wall, where you're facing challenge, where you're facing your need of a breakthrough or a miracle, all you need to do, very simple, is believe that God has given you the victory and obey what God has called you to do. Because he is king. Here, the commander of the Lord's army, Joshua, comes before God and he says, Lord, what do I do? How do I take this city? God just gives him a very simple thing. Just walk around. But tell your people to keep their mouth quiet. Why did God make the people quiet? Do you know it was their mouth that got them into the trouble 40 years ago in the wilderness? Because this is a bunch of people that know how to murmur. And complain. Even when manna flows from heaven, they got nothing. Manna comes from heaven. They look at it and go, what is it? You know, manna means what is it in Hebrew. Every day they pick up, what is it? What are you eating? What is it? It is every day. It is a bread of heaven. It is what angels eat, the Bible says. You know, it's God gives them wonderful. One rabbi went to an extreme and he said, this manna, The reason why it is what is it is because whatever you think about at that time, that's what it tastes like in your mouth. I said, wow, I'll be having good biryani and nasi lemak. But anyway, that's another story. But what is it? You know these people, they, they in their mouth. They complain in their mouth. They murmur because even though they may say in my heart, I believe. But in their mouth, it's never aligned to their heart. It is, it is, it is. It complains and murmurs. And God says to them, the wisest thing you can do for yourself when you're facing a challenge is keep your mouth shut. Walk around in that silence. Just obey God. Hold your tongue. You know, how many of you would say, if I had held my tongue, my marriage would be in a better place. If I know how to hold my tongue, I would have a better relationship with my children. If I just know how to hold my tongue, I actually would have a great relationship at workplace. 
lot of times, nobody regrets their silence. Everybody regrets words spoken. You got to know when you're following God, follow him fully. Follow him fully, irrespective of how you feel. Like they would, have, they would have thought, what, this wall will come down if we just walk around six days? What talk you, Joshua? I think, Joshua, did you really hear God? Was it, was it six, one day, six times? Or is it six times, one day? I'm confusing myself now. <laughs> is it one time each day? And then on the seventh day, it is, is it seven times? Why? Why like that? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have to make any sense. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. The key word for that word is Proverbs 3, 5. It's not trust and acknowledge. The key word is what? All. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will make your path straight. In other words, whatever God has spoken, obey. Whatever God has spoken, believe and do it. And when you believe that this is what God is speaking to me about, and in, in faith you rise up and you, and you take hold of what God has spoken, and by faith you, you obey God, you respond to the call that he gives you, by faith you lay hold of what God is calling you to do as a family, as an individual, what happens? You see exciting stuff happening. And I'm thankful that that's what it is about. Being a disciple, being a disciple of a certain kind. That is what it is about. Being a disciple of a certain kind. What is a disciple? A disciple is somebody who learns from Jesus. A disciple of Jesus is someone who learns from Jesus how to run his life, how to manage his life, how to steward his life, how to live in his marriage, how to live out his values, how to live his faith in the workplace. He learns from Jesus. And not only he learns from Jesus, that's a disciple, but he is continually allowing Jesus to master his life. He not only knows the word of God, but he, he, he allows the God of the word to master his life. He doesn't just master the word of God where he can quote scriptures. You know, he knows what Nehemiah is about, what Matthew is about. No, it's not just mastering the word of God, but letting the word of God master me. That my life will be aligned to God and his purposes. He is king. He says, it doesn't make sense, but I obey. I follow. I believe. I respond. And I obey. And I obey wholeheartedly. That, that will make the Jericho wall come down flat. The discipleship of a certain kind that we are thankful for in this house is all about obeying God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 28, Go into the world, preach the gospel, baptize them, and then what? Teach them to obey. Teach them all things to obey. Not just tell them what to do, but teach them to obey. Not just information here, but transformation of heart. Lives change because obedience come in. Obedience come in. And I'm thankful that God is doing that in our midst. When I looked at this chapter, one thing that intrigued me is this. That God was so good in demonstrating that he is God over every aspect if we just believe and follow and trust him. You know, in my personal life, I've experienced that numerous times. You've heard all my, most of my testimonies. There are some I keep for time to come. But the reality is that God is a God who, if you just believe and trust and follow him, he's a good God. Like two years ago when we were buying this preschool next door, the owner gave his verbal word, made an agreement with me and said, let's, we'll sell to you at this price, 1.62 million. I heard the Lord. The Lord spoke very clearly. As a leadership team, we prayed. We heard God collectively and the Lord spoke very clearly. Go and offer him that. So we went, offered him 1.62. He said, I'll take it off the market, but he didn't. He allowed it to be in the market. And in the market, there were people who were coming to buy. But we heard what God said. That's it. We went in. We, we, we said yes. But he continued to put it in the market. And there were bidders that come in later who were going up 1.7. Later on, I find out there was one particular buyer from Asia that was very keen on buying it at two. 
So it could have gone even higher. But when we went before the presence of God, the Lord said, 1.62, that's it, you're not going back. So he came to us and says, let's renegotiate price. Price has gone up. More people are interested. It has to go up. We went before the Lord. We asked the Lord what we do. The Lord spoke very clearly again. Not a single dollar more. Not a single. How, how, doesn't make sense. You don't, un- but Lord, but you don't understand Castle Hill. <laughs> Hot property right now. You don't understand there are Chinese buyers from mainland China with cash in the bag. You don't understand what is going on in this scenario. You tell me you stay on the same price. What do I do? What do you do? You do what the Bible says. You trust God and you obey Him. It makes no sense you obey Him. You come back and you say, Lord, this is it. So it's a very interesting meeting. We had our council sat together with the owners. We sat down, we dialogued. It went for an hour, no resolution. Two hours, no resolution. He didn't move, we didn't move. He said, what, you can't move a little bit? No, no, no. We're, not moving a, we're not moving a single dollar more. That's it. At the end of that meeting, I don't know how long it took, probably a couple of hours and even more than that. And no numerous little 10 minute break here and there. Come back. He said, I think we are going to give it to you. Same price, locked in. This is it. I tell you what, if God has spoken, you just obey. If God has spoken, you just trust God and you wait. Don't be afraid to, don't have that, don't have that Asian kiasu mentality. What is kiasu mentality, Pastor? Kiasu is a word for afraid to lose. I don't want to be standing in the buffet line at the last. Why? I'm afraid everybody will eat up everything good. So I want to be in the first in the line. That's kiasu. But I'm thinking, it's okay. Let God be God. And if he speaks to you about something, obey. Just trust in him. It doesn't make any sense. But believe. And when you say, this is what it is, you... Quiet. You wait for the timing of the Lord. And in the timing of the Lord, God says, now speak. You shout now. You shout now. One of the things I realized is if I want to trust God and follow God, I want to follow God wholeheartedly in every aspect, not just in some, but in all aspects. And if he says, stay silent, stay silent. If he says, speak, you speak. That's why when I get up here, I don't get up here because I have to say something. I get up here time and time again because I have something to say. And I believe that God has a word for us this morning, a reminder that it is God who builds not us. It is God who builds his church. It is Christ who died for his church. It is Holy Spirit who empowers his church. It is Holy Spirit who works in each and every individual and brings change of heart, change of transformation of lives. It is Holy Spirit who aligns us back to his word of God. We are mere instruments who hear him, believe in him, and is foolish enough to obey what he says. And just do it. Nike stole it from us. Just do it. But in this case, when you do it, our God is a good God. He's a good God. Here, I want to give you one more scripture. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6. And verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 7. This is a passage where King Solomon was building the temple in the Old Testament. We've been studying the book of Ecclesiastes. And we know how God has blessed Solomon with an incredible wisdom. But we, here we find a snippet of how, an insight into how they built the temple. When Solomon commissioned that let's build the temple for the glory of God. In the, in the place in Jerusalem. He actually sent. The Bible says in chapter 5 and chapter 6. You go home and read. 30,000 men he assigned. 30,000 laborers to come and build the, temp, the temple. But where was the temple? The rocks and the, and the stones. Where were they done? They were done in quarries in Lebanon. It's a neighboring country right now. It's a neighboring it's a faraway land. So he had everybody go to Lebanon, cut wood, cut stones, 
do all those things and then they bring it back they bring it back to Jerusalem and they lay the bricks one upon the other I want you to pay attention to this verse and I want you to see the beautiful picture that it emerges here when the house meaning referring to the temple when the temple was built it was with stone prepared at the quarry so that neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the house while it was being built I want you to think about it when you come into Jerusalem and you are watching people build the temple the Solomon's temple being built it is a magnificent building you can see it from a distance it is on the mountain top you can see it from all over and people as they come in they can't hear any axe they can't hear any hammer they can't hear any chisel they can't hear any of the noise it was done in such silence the stone was being laid one upon the other and it was building being built and they were wondering wow is this really being built yes it's being built but it's being done in absolute reverential silence I want you to don't miss this why because the greatest things that God does he does it quietly not fanfare not the big announcements not the spectacular put the floodlights on spotlight this is what I'm doing he doesn't do anything in Jerusalem Bethlehem a baby was born who paid attention to it many missed it many didn't know it was a son of God becoming son of man being born there in a manger he comes in his entry for 30 years very quiet the way God does things is very quiet that's why sometimes we miss it we miss it because we are wired to the spectacular we are wired towards the spectacular but the way that God does he does it in silence he does it quietly he does it in small changes he does it in simple means and in those simple things that you do those natural things that he asks you to do there is a supernatural flow that brings him glory can you say amen so here they were building they were building and then seven years later seven years later the temple was fully complete people could come in and rejoice and say wow that is awesome why I'm saying these things I want you to pay attention to this because God is at work in this house don't miss it don't miss it it's quietly happening God is realigning hearts back to himself God is aligning people's values back to his word God is putting hunger deep down in the hearts of people to not be about the external but about the internal and it's about the eternal God is saying it is no longer about the wealth creation and accumulation and position and haggling and, and, and working on these things it's not about rushing here rushing there and doing all these things but it's about coming before the Lord and saying Lord let me hear you let me follow you let me do what you're asking me to do let me prioritize my life around your purposes about your kingdom about your word I want to live for your glory is that happening here I'm asking you it is don't miss it that's the beautiful picture that's the beautiful picture I want you to catch because when I wake up in the morning I ask before the Lord every single day Lord help me see what I need to see because these things is happening quietly there are so many unsung heroes in this room when I can go around talking about them that have made radical alignments shifts in their life because of following Jesus and God says this is what I want you to do and they are making shifts and as a result their lives are being radically transformed their children and and their marriage is being restored being reconciled being restored and their family life is coming together God is at work don't miss it God is at work but it's happening quietly I look at it like this that God is just taking one stone after another in the quarry shaping it the way he wants it then he brings into the temple sets it up and he's building the Bible says in the New Testament you and I we are living stones being put together and the temple of God is being built 
I believe God is preparing us, his church, on this earth. He chisels a lot of things from our lives, creates that stone in this earthly quarry, so that one day we go as living stones into, tem- into, into heaven and where we become together for the glory of God. Are you with me? God is doing that. God is shaping that right in this place. And that is what I'm really thankful for. So as a, fa- as a pastor, I'm thankful for what God is at work in this house. And in this case, all you need to know is we only do what God says. We only follow what he says for us to do. We don't want to be the fastest and the largest. We don't want to be doing those, pushing those buttons to entertain and to, and to, and to make people feel good. It is about declaring the word of God. It is about saying this is the truth. Align your life to the truth. And let the word of God come and change and transform. Let it, let it shape your life in such a way that you become a, 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 a stone that can come into the temple and find its place. And let God quietly build for his glory. Can you say amen? amen. And that when we do like what Joshua did in following as a whole nation. Hearing God and following Joshua, they come together, they believe the call of God, they by faith, they lay hold of it, and they just follow orders. And as they were doing it, without anything that they have to do, the wall came tumbling down. And the possessions is ours. I believe with all my heart as a pastor, as I stand here, as I declare over the 2016 and beyond, I declare that we have a faithful father. I declare that we have a God in heaven who loves us so much. I declare that Christ is building his church, that Jesus is building his house, and there are things that he's working deep down in our hearts. So the three things that I always say is happening in our midst, that God is enlarging the community where guests come in as guests and they become friends and they become family. Where people are coming in and casual relationship with God. Become committed in their relationship with God. But they deal with their carnality and they come and become consecrated individuals before God. God is doing the consecration in our midst. People come in and they, and they say, Lord, I want to win the lost. I want, to make, I want to make disciples. I want to live my life for things that matter in eternity. The souls of men that will go into eternity with me. I want to do what God calls me to do. I want to serve God on his terms, not on my terms. I want to live for his glory. I want to steward my life. God is at work. Those three things are happening guests are becoming friends and becoming family people are coming in and they are becoming consecrated in their life carnality is being dealt with double-mindedness is being dealt with living with hypocritical life being cultural christians are being dealt with we are becoming biblical being consecrated that god is doing in our midst not only that god is putting a design our hearts to win to change to send to win the lost to disciple people to invest our lives to serve and to steward for the kingdom of god for the long haul so that a church is ready for the coming of the lord and when that beautiful time comes i believe god will tell us It's enough to be silent. Now shout. And the day will come when we will shout. And we will take the city in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And I feel the anointing of God in this house. Even as I'm speaking, I sense there are walls that are coming down in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your areas of life. I want you to believe God for this. I want you to believe God. I want you to lay hold in faith and take that promise. See, I have given you Jericho, its king. And it's mighty men of valor. See, I have already done this. God has given you the city. God has given you this nation. God has given you your workplace. God has given you your family. God has given you the grace to go and possess in His name. 
souls of men that need to come into the kingdom of God. The harvest that will come into the kingdom because you obeyed God. I want you to I want you to trust God this morning in spite of what you see. Come before God and say, "Lord, by faith I want to lay hold of it and I want to just follow you, Lord. Obey you, just obey you." Even if it doesn't seem right, even if it doesn't make any sense, I want to obey you. I want to honor you. I want to live for you. I want to I want to do all that you ask me to do. I want to just do it for you, Lord. Come before God. It is not for us. It is for his glory. It is not what we do. It is what he does. It is not for to establish a name. It's not for establishing a a a, a, a ministry. It is not to establish what we want to do, but it's what God wants to get done. Come, align, surrender, steward. Just obey him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, even as we finish this year in this ministry year, I thank you, Father God, for your faithfulness in our lives. I thank you for your goodness in our lives. I thank you for your grace upon our lives. We lack nothing. Everything has been abundantly supplied by your grace. And Lord Jesus, for all that you have done, what can we do but but to surrender our life, but to submit to your word and to give ourselves completely wholeheartedly and willingly. Lord, we want to lay down our lives before you. We ask that you would complete your work that you have begun in our midst, Lord. Lord, we want to do what you have called us to do. And we want to follow you wholeheartedly, obey you gladly, and make your name known and make disciples of all nations. Give us that grace, mighty God. Lord, I pray for every family in this house. I thank you for changes that are happening. I thank you for the work that you are doing in each individual. Lord, I pray that you continue to make us mighty God, Christ followers, Christ mastered, and Christ ambassadors. Continue to empower us with your grace. Continue to empower us with your Holy Spirit. Accomplish that deep work in our midst. Continue to raise families in our midst. Continue to increase our community. Continue to increase our consecration. Continue to increase the call of God and the contribution that we make in disciple making. So Father, we thank you, we praise you. We give you all the glory, all the praise and all the honor. In Jesus' precious name. And the people of God said, Amen. Let's sing this chorus. Hallelujah.